record on this computer. And I'm going to share. Just give me a moment here. Uh, I can close all of this and this. All right. And I'm going to share this screen. Okay. There we are. All right. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm not, I, I'm obviously I'm going to talk, but I want to talk less than I did last time. So <laughs> um, I will, uh, I will go ahead and, um, sorry, just a sec. Go ahead and ask some questions. Um, ask some questions as we continue to dive in. So hopefully you guys remember from uh, from last week, remember some stuff from last week. And um, hold on, let me just, uh, Marco, I'm not sure I know who Marco is. Marco, hello, Marco. Don't know if you can hear us. But um, yeah, if you want to send a text, uh, shoot shoot up a little text and just let us know. Um, it, that might be Liam. I don't know, but yeah, just um, welcome along, and uh, we're just getting started. Okay, so um, yeah, so hopefully you guys remember from last week a little bit from last week, and um, you know we will. Uh, I'm going to quiz you guys now in a moment. Uh, Ebenezer is just joining in, so um, he should be able to join us for a little quiz here in a second. He showed up right on time. He showed up in time for the quiz. <laughs> hey, Ebenezer, how are you, man? I'm doing well, Pastor. How are you? Fantastic, man. We were just about to do a little quiz from uh, from 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 our from our map from last week. Um, so I'm sharing my screen. Hopefully, you can see it there. Okay. Um, let's see here. Mr. Set, can you tell me what 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 did the cathedral represent in this uh, little map that we drew last week? It just represents the cathedral, doesn't it? <laughs> the church. <laughs> it is um it is a church, isn't it? Um, but um, it's the traditional way that we think that church is, but people are attending the church. But not everyone else now regard that as so important. Like now we yeah. are kind of like having some form of service, but you know, we are not in a church setting. If it was 20 years ago, you'd be doing this seminar in, in the church. Yeah, that's right. Now there's you're 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 right, but there's there's a specific element that I want you to fish, that I want you to dig out of here. Um, definitely church, um, I church culture, very central. I think I'll do that. I think. I Let me just, uh, um, yeah. oh, wait, it was, sorry, Ebenezer, were, I don't know if you were talking to us, Ebenezer, or, um, or if you were talking to answer someone. the question. Yeah, I don't know if he was trying to answer the question or if he was talking with someone else, but you yes, are muted. Um, am I muted still? Hello? No, 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 I can hear you now. Okay, did you want to jump in? Yep, so is the okay. church, so at that point, it was more like the church was the source of the truth. So the yes. church was the source of more like, look up to the church if you want to know anything about what is true, look mm -hmm. at the church. Yep, so I absolutely. So I think that era. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, well said. Um, so the church represented that time, um, again, in, in history where, um, where people generally saw uh, truth as being found, not just necessarily in the church, but also in the preacher, um, in the religious text in the Bible. Um, and so if you had any questions about truth, that's where you went. All right, David, can you hear us, David? Yes, I am here. Okay, uh, talk to me about the next stage. What are, what are we looking at here with the little laboratory flasks there? What, what does that represent? So I think it was when society tried to find answers in science. Mm -hmm. Yep, well done, well done, precisely. Um, they lost their trust in religion. And of course, these things are mapped out. And when you map out, you lose nuance. I hope everyone here is aware of that. 
Um, the world didn't magically go from church to science overnight. It was a long, messy process that bled into each other. But there was a trend. There was a trend where people began moving away from religion as the source of truth and thinking science is going to provide that for us. Um, and don't forget that these two systems also promised a better world. That's very key here. They both promised a better world. Um, and in the eyes of the culture, they both failed. And so that's what brought us to this maze. Let me see if Jill can remember what the maze represented. Oh, um, from my memory, which isn't always the best, but uh, it was people um, were sort of searching in different areas and moving more away from traditional churches. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so they moved away from traditional churches. Yeah, and there was the the number of people interested in, in spiritual beliefs was dropping dramatically as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there was one key thing that was kind of chucked in the bin during this era. Do you remember what it was? Uh, no. Okay, somebody want to help her? There was Truth. one key thing. Truth. There you go. Truth. Yes. So absolutely right, Jill. People were moving away from um, faith, moving away from spiritual themes, um, but they were also moving away from science and, um, and the reliance on science to give us answers about the meaning of life. They were moving away from existentialism and the reliance on philosophy to give us answers for the meaning of life. Basically, there was no truth. Um, and now there was a key reason why truth became such a, such a suspicious thing. Let's see if anyone here can remember that, because this is kind of like the central theme of all of this. If we can remember this, everything else will make a bit more sense. Um, I remember truth was used as a weapon to kind of entrap and then to control, sort mm -hmm. of. So yep. they felt like, yes, truth was more like an abusive concept that mm -hmm. It's being used to kind of manipulate um, people and then to take control of people. So they felt like absolutely. then there yeah, may be no truth. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said, Ebenezer. Well said. Don't forget that because that's going to be very central to the rest of our conversation today. Truth for us as Adventists is a beautiful thing. But in the general culture, truth became seen as, uh, as a tool of oppression. It was weaponized during the Dark Ages. Um, it was weaponized during the ages of religious war that followed the dark ages between Protestants and Catholics. Um, it was weaponized by science. <laughs> like it was, it was weaponized by capitalism and, you know, like it was, it's just weaponized by everything. And so people began to think, well, maybe the way to build a better world is to abandon the concept of truth. Maybe that's where all the injustice comes from. Okay. So. People move beyond the age of the maze, though, because they discover that this is a it, it's too cynical to live there. It's just, you know, OK, there's no such thing as truth, but that's just a very cynical way to live. And we're not going to get anywhere good with with that way of living. Um, so we moved into uh, this little symbol here is a pendulum. Um, now, can someone remind or tell us what the pendulum? I'll take a volunteer on this one. What did the pendulum represent? Was it your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth? Yep, that's half of it, because that was also present during the maze. But there was a there was a uh, this something about the pendulum that's a bit unique. It's the same as the maze, but also different. OK, let me try and throw in some hints to see if we can pick it up. So. In the pendulum, they continue to believe what was taught in the maze, that uh, truth doesn't exist. There's no such thing as absolute truth. But they realized, the culture realized, we can't live with, cyn with the cynicism that comes with that, because that's just a very toxic way to live. So we want the promise that there's a better future that religion and science gave us. But we also want to continue to believe that truth isn't absolute. So we want basically the best that both worlds have to offer, if you can call it that, which is why there's a pendulum. You know, I said I was going to drop hints, and instead I gave you guys the answers. Look at a terrible teacher. My goodness. <laughs> it's a pendulum, so right? 
Yeah, does that mean people were sitting on the fence or? So not so much sitting on the fence. Sitting on the fence means that you're indecisive. And yeah. and believe you me, I, I, I don't expect the pendulum to be something that you're like, ah, that makes sense. Because it kind of doesn't, and that's the point. It's not really ever supposed to make sense. Um, but it's not sitting on the fence because sitting on the fence means you're indecisive. There is a decision that has been made at this stage of development in Western culture. The decision is... There is no absolute truth, but we want to believe the world's headed somewhere good. So we bounce back and forth without a yeah. rhythm. There's no, it's, so that's the, the downside to the pendulum. The pendulum has a rhythm. So in this bounce back and forth, there's no rhythm. It's just, yeah, non-rhythmic, I suppose is the best way. I can't, I can't think of a better, of another example, but yeah, there's, there's no rhythm between the back and forth, but it's like, I don't believe there's such a thing as an absolute truth, but I don't want to live with the cynicism of the maze that said that the world's just headed toward dystopia. I want to believe we're headed somewhere good. Um, and so a perfect example of that is something like social justice, right? Social justice is huge today. People, especially younger generations, are very passionate about social justice. The whole idea behind social justice is that if we work hard enough, we can engineer a better world for everyone. But they hold on to that belief while at the same time believing there's no absolute truth to anchor that better world in. Now, how do you make sense of that? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think you're supposed to. I think that's just what it is. So that leads us then to the city of Mech. Because when you're bouncing back and forth non-rhythmically between there's no such thing as truth, but we want a better world, you end up with a giant buffet of options because there's no such thing as truth. So everything's on the table. And it's just like everyone just pick whatever you want and let's rebuild, let's make a better world. And you just can't end up in a world where people are just apathetic toward anything that's a truth claim because there's just too many options. There's no absolute truth. There's just an endless smorgasbord of competing ideas. And so that kind of leads us into a stage of our cultural development in the West where people are just generally apathetic toward anything to do with God. And comfort and distraction has a lot to do with this as well. We talked about last time. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about the map before we get practical and start looking at how do we engage this culture? Would you have roughly a date when the transition started happening? Oh, these are really rough. Okay, so the age of the cathedral, um, that ended at about the time of, you could, you could say the time of the, the um, French Revolution. So 17, what is that, 1790s, uh, seven, late 1780s, French Revolution, they crown reason, you know, the crowning of reason, and you had things like the scientific revolution, uh, the, the industrial revolution, all those things that, that kind of were all at play. So I'd say roughly speaking 1790s, although the world was still deeply religious for a long time, but the transition began then and it just got stronger and stronger. Um, the age of science was probably in full effect, um, arguably around Ellen White's day, 1800s, leading into the 1900s. People really thought we were going to have a utopia because of science. It was going to fix all the human problems. Um, so it was probably like 1800s. And then between during the 1900s, that ship came crashing down with World War I and World War II, especially World War II and atomic weapons, where people realized actually the science that promised us this utopia has created the possibility that we can completely annihilate ourselves from existence. So the age of the maze, which is, and by the way, let me, let me give you guys the technical terms that philosophers use only because you'll probably, if you want to study this more, you'll probably encounter these terms. The age of the cathedral is known as the pre-modern age. The age of the laboratory is known as the modern age. 
Um, and so, yeah, World War II, atomic bombs, you know, you got the Nazis with their crazy ideas and, you, you know, uh, um, what did you call it? What did I, what were the words I used last time? Um, I forget right now, it's just late, but, you know, scientific ideas like Aryan people are more and more, you know, um, evolved than others. And uh, if people have disabilities, you use science to sterilize them so they can't reproduce, you know, all these types of things just killed people's trust in science, the scientific promise, the modern promise of utopia. So we go into the age of the maze roughly between, maybe you could arguably say 1940s, 1950s um is it's but it was it was already at play before then it, it the age of the maze kind of started with friedrich nietzsche um still back in the 1800s but it, it kind of took full effect then um so the age of the maze is um postmodernism is what the technical term is uh and so that lasted roughly until about the 1970s 1980s where the age of the pendulum or the meta modern age started to kick in. Um, so the meta modern age started to kick in probably 1970s, roughly 1980s, and it's really taken off probably since like it like become a cultural phenomenon since 2014. Um, but it started back in the 70s, 80s, and the city of Meh is just it's not really a phase. It's not a new phase. It's just the context or the social mood that has been created by the pendulum so it's not a new philosophical phase of that people are, are wrestling with it's just this is the cultural mood that's been created um does that does that help david yeah thank you so much no dramas man um so you know one of the sad things about this is that um as a church we started talking about reaching postmoderns like around 2005 2006 that's kind of when the church finally realized we should try to figure out, you know, they, they start, they created the, the center for postmodern and secular studies. And the GC was trying to figure out like, how do we reach these people and how do we recreate sources, resources to, to reach postmodern people uh, without realizing that postmodernism had already been dead <laughs> for like almost 30 years. So it's, it just kind of shows you like, sometimes we're really far behind, like what the shifts are. Um, but now we're kind of in this in this stage now the meta modern stage and we're only just now I, I actually got an email just a few weeks ago from um some people saying hey we're creating some resources for reaching postmoderns at the gc can you give us some thoughts on and and it was you know it's a good initiative i'm really happy about it but at the same time it's like hey postmodernism's old man <laughs> like we should be creating resources for the meta modernists but that's you know um at least at least there's some motion there okay all right, so I want to get I want to get practical. Does anyone have any more questions about the map before? Because once I finish the map, I'm kind of done with the map, and we're going to move into some practical things. So, so would you say the periods overlap each other? They overlap each other incredibly. And the other thing to keep in mind is that um, each of these periods still exists depending on where you are. So my, my the Latino the Latino world that I come from is still in the cathedral. They haven't even moved into the laboratory, right? So for the most part, if you're going to evangelize Latinos, you still have to use the models of the that were used in the age of the cathedral. They still work. Um, there's also still modernists, right? So a modernist would be someone like your typical atheist or agnostic, um, uh, people who are into like Richard Dawkins and you know, um, you know those those kinds of guys. I forget that all all the names now. Um, and uh, these kinds of guys generally to reach them requires a good knowledge of apologetics and you know they, they're asking questions like how do you know that god exists that's not really a question post or metamodernist asks ask um it's a modern question um so this this is it's so it's like each each one requires a different approach is what i'm saying so like people in the cathedral will probably ask questions like why do you guys go to church on sabbath and not sunday Right. Someone in the modern phase or the laboratory way of thinking isn't going to care about that question because their question is, how do you even know God exists? You know, um, and generally speaking, someone in the postmodern phase isn't going to care about either of those questions because they don't even believe truth exists. <laughs> um, and then someone in the, the meta modern phase is 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 likely to not care about any question at all. 
So engage it. And I'm going to talk about like how you actually engage them now in a, in a, in a few moments. Um, but does that help set? Yes, it does. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So they overlap each other deeply and it's important to recognize that the entire globe isn't like in the pendulum that is emerging generations. So you think about young people today and um, young generations. Uh, my generation was more impacted by the maze, younger generations to mine, the generation Z and generation alpha deeply impacted by the pendulum. Um, and so, but there's still people who are still in, like, it's sort of in the laboratory. So yeah, like you always have to keep in mind that the world isn't neat little blocks, is very messy and intertwined and yeah. Um, okay. All right, I'm going to move on now. If anyone has any other questions, just go ahead and ask them. Um, but I'm going to move now into how do you share when they don't care, right? Because um, again, like I said, people in the maze are generally going to care and they might have religious questions for you. They might want to know why you go to church on Sabbath instead of Sunday. Um, they might want to know why you believe uh, or what you believe happens when you die. So like the traditional approach of Adventist evangelism, the questions that we answer, very effective in that frame, in that cultural frame. Um, people in the laboratory may have questions about the existence of God or the reliability or why do you believe in creation and not evolution and those kinds of discussions, which also, if you look at more modern Adventist evangelists, does, those questions are generally in in the presentations like on their sermon on sabbath they might talk about evolution and you know creation and and how the sabbath plays into both of those um generally questions that modernists would ask um not post or meta modernists and so when you get into the meta modern phase and the younger generations today you do have this general trend of apathy and that's the difficult thing because with a religious person regardless of their worldview there's no apathy with a modernist, regardless of how much they don't like Christianity or the belief in God, they're not apathetic about that conversation. They're willing to have it. In fact, they're happy to have it because they want to show you that <laughs> you're deluded, right? <laughs> um, but with post and modernity, there's just this apathy. It's like, I don't even want to have this conversation, right? So how, to, how do we engage it then? So let me share some general themes to keep in mind, and then I'll get a little bit more specific. Here's the very first thing that I found, and I, I can only speak from my own experience here, because one of the things I found with engaging culture today is that there's no formula. If you're looking for a silver bullet, if you're looking for a formula, it's never, you're never going to find it. Because modern culture today, deeply impacted by the maze and the pendulum, is so fragmented that the secular person who lives across the road from me is going to be significantly different to the secular person who lives two blocks from me or maybe on the other side on the other side in the house on the other side of me right there's no silver lining that connects the, the way they all think there's some general trends but there's no real silver lining they're very fragmented which means you really have to get to know people if you want to reach them there's no silver bullet there's no glow track there's is you just really got to get to know people and hear their stories and, and build trust. And I'll go to that in a second. But the bottom line is there's no silver bullet, but there's three general themes to keep in mind. The first one is the apathy that we're seeing in the culture today is a trauma response. In fact, apathy in general tends to be a traumatic, a response to trauma. And I'm gonna speak into this one more than the other two. The other two, I'm just going to brush by. I'm just going to focus on this one because I think this is the one that we as Adventists have a unique capacity to engage in a really powerful way. But the very first thing I would say is that apathy is a trauma response. And so when we have a culture that's generally apathetic toward anything to do with God, what we're dealing with is unprocessed trauma. And it may be passed down from their parents and their parents, but it's an unprocessed trauma. There's, there's a wound, there's a fear, there's a discomfort, there's something there, hasn't been addressed, and it's manifesting as apathy, right? Um, the others are comfort and distraction. I'm not going to talk about comfort and distraction because then this session will just go for way too long and it's too much details. We can talk about those in future sessions a little bit more. I want to focus on trauma because essentially the city of Meh 
is a is a city that has been built on the trauma of religion, the trauma of institutions, the trauma of cynicism, and we're basically trying to rebuild the world through this unprocessed trauma. So that just you know manifests as apathy, meh. Um, and so engaging that is going to look much different to how we engage people who think along the cathedral or even the laboratory frame of mind, right? It's gonna look much different. I would say this, it will require a lot more sacrifice to engage this generation. It will require a lot more death to self um, because you can't create a flyer and mail it out that they'll respond to. Number one, it's fragmented. Number two, they're apathetic toward anything to do with religion, right? With a flyer, you might attract people in the cathedral mindset, maybe even in the laboratory mindset if it's like, you know, marketed right. But particularly within the pendulum, it's just not really going to attract anyone. Um, and so what does that mean? Does that mean we just give up and say, oh, I guess people aren't interested, so we're just not going to try? No, it means we have to try something different. And by different, what we mean is deeply relational and really getting deep into knowing people. Okay, so trauma. What do I mean by trauma? Um, the church has hurt the world. Now, this is a statement that as Seventh-day Adventists, we can actually stand behind because it's basically what we preach when we preach the book of Daniel. <laughs> right? Most other friends I have from different denominations struggle to get behind this statement because they want to defend the church because they don't have the same apocalyptic vision that we have. Um, within Adventism, it's a little different. We recognize that the primary tool of warfare that has, that has fought against God throughout history has actually been the church. And um, we're, we're comfortable with, with engaging in that conversation. The church has hurt the world. And the collective trauma of that hurt hasn't healed. People are still reeling from that, even if they're not actively thinking about it, right? Lies about God cause individual and social damage. Um, and so what I mean by this is that, and I was actually sharing this with, with uh, some, some friends today, that it's amazing how a church that you've never set foot in I'm thinking of the medieval church here, a church that you've never set foot in, that you've probably never given money to, and never even thought about, still controls the way you think of and relate to God. And that should bother you a little bit. <laughs> All right. So lies about God, ideas like eternal hellfire, you know, ideas like God is this dictator in the sky coercive, controlling, manipulative, um, things like the Crusades, the Inquisitions, and that's old. I mean, even if you come into the modern age, you'll think of, you can think of all the abuse that people have suffered at the hands of religious institutions, and that this abuse is often justified in the name of, of God. Um, these, this creates an, a picture of God that's fundamentally false in people's minds, and they're responding to that picture. Which is why I often say to people, if someone rejects God, it may not be that they've rejected God. It may be that they're rejecting a certain picture of God, and they think that that's who God is. And so our responsibility, and again, I think as Adventists, we have a really unique opportunity here, is to reveal to the world the truth about God's character of love. That's pretty much what our mission is set. I, I don't know if you're putting your hands up or clapping there. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> ah, it was a clap. It was a clap. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Awesome. So new picture of God revelation of his character of love. I believe that this is why the Adventist church exists is to be to, to reveal to the world, the truth about God's character of love. One of the guys that I've been working with for the last two years, secular friend who um, has been undergoing, um, he's, he's a former drug addict. So um, he came out of rehab. I met him when he came out of rehab. And I've been discipling him for two years now. And one of the things that he just could not wrap his head around, 
And it, it was a barrier, a huge barrier between him and God. He was terrified of God. And um, he, he opened up to me one day and said, you know, I just don't understand how a God of love could torture people in hell forever. It just doesn't make any sense. I can't wrap my head around it. Like I just, I've tried, I've tried justifying it. I've tried, you know, doing the dance that most churches do. And it's like, I just can't, I just think it's disgusting. <laughs> um, and I was so thankful that as an Adventist, I had the worldview that could actually touch that trauma with truth that has healing power. So I want you guys to keep this idea of trauma in mind. People are generally responding to God from a place of trauma. And so that should inform the way we approach them, the way we relate to them, the way we interact with them. Um, we're essentially dealing with a traumatized culture. Is that the case in every, you know, like, is it, is it like that for everyone? Not necessarily. Some people are just, you know, full of anger and just want to pick on you because you're a Christian, but for the most part, people are, are traumatized, right? People are traumatized. Um, and so <clears throat> there's five keys for engagement, or I would say five layers for engagement that I want to talk about in a moment, but I'll see if there's any questions or any thoughts before we look at the five layers. And I want to talk through the five layers with you guys too. Um, let me just see how much time I've got left here. Yeah, 736. All right, we have, we have good time. Okay, uh, are there any questions or thoughts based on, on any of this so far? Yeah, I, I came up with uh, an idea a couple of years ago, and this fits for me, but I'd love some opinions on it. I would like to see us create like a human library, and you pick people with trauma incidents that you're talking about, and then other people come in and sit with them and talk and hear their stories. and. I just, I haven't put it all together. I wanted to talk to you, Pastor Marcus, about this. I've written some notes. But I see it as an incredible way to get first hand, face to face uh, question and answers as well. Hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I would love to talk more about that with you because I think that's a really cool idea. And I'd like to see yeah. how, how we can actually organize something like that logistically and set it up. I'm pretty sure I saw some years ago a similar thing. It wasn't an evangelistic thing. It was, uh, I think it had to do with um, the Holocaust. They created a human library of people who had survived. And then people could just walk in and sit with survivors and hear their stories and, um, and talk with them. And it was really powerful in, in connecting and engaging with people. Yeah, so I I'd love to talk about that some more. Um, and I would say as well, Jill, that I think... Um, it's, it's absolutely essential for us in the modern age when it comes to reaching out and connecting with people um, for each of us to, e to be equipped or to take the time to equip ourselves uh, to effectively engage people on that l understanding of how trauma works and on that level of trauma. Yes. If, if yes. we can equip ourselves with that and we, we've got the understanding of how to work with trauma but also the truth that we hold um, and we br bring those two together, I think, I think we could do something beautiful. And think about it this way, guys, the word doctrine, the word doctrine is a Latin word that has two meanings. Um, one meaning is teaching and the other meaning is doctor. Sorry, the word doctrine etymologically is rooted in doctor and also rooted in teaching. And in the early years, as when Latin was still a, a spoken language, um, people, when they heard the word doctrine, what they understood it with those two elements at play, a doctor and a teaching, which meant the word doctrine for people when they heard it, what they heard was a healing teaching. That's what a doctrine is. It's a healing teaching. And when we treat doctrine as merely academic information that we can argue and fight with people over, we, we lose the healing part, right? Doctrine is, is healing teaching. It's a truth that God has revealed to humanity through, through which we can actually heal. 
And especially today, as people are still sort of reeling from the trauma of institutional religion and the crazy things that the church has taught historically about God, healing teachings, I believe, is, is something that the world really needs to hear. Now, how we do that is going to look different because you can't just say, you know, put out a flyer and send it out and say, we're having a, a series of talks on healing teaching. Like no one's going to, well, I'm sure someone will come, but <laughs> um, not very many people will. Um, so but, the, the but, engagement has to be more personal. Go on, Jill. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that um, I've approached different um little places like uh, Manjima and even like when I lived down in, in Denmark, um, I've spoken to someone in the Uniting Church about this human library and you can have different uh, things, but it is what you're saying, that interaction on a personal mm -hmm. level. And it's so powerful, the outcome, it really is. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I just think, for me, uh, I'm really excited about it, and I see so yeah. much potential coming from it. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked to, to chat with you more about about how we can set something like that up, Jill. That's that's a really cool yeah. idea. Let, let me let me walk through um, some practical steps on um, on engaging secular seekers, and these steps come primarily from our own personal experience, but I know many other missionaries in this context who use the same steps. Um, before I share what I'm about to share, I'll, I'll introduce it this way. Um, historically speaking, the way in which we engage people is we invite them to an event in the church. Um, maybe it's an evangelistic series or a special program, a visitor Sabbath of some sort. That's generally how we invite people or, or engage people. And, um, and if they don't respond, then the, we, we tend to assume that they must not be interested. That could potentially be true if you're dealing with a culture that is still in the cathedral mindset. But when you're dealing with a culture, which we are in now, uh, it could very well be that they are very interested in God and very, they have many questions about their own mortality and their own existence and the meaning of life. But church itself is just too foreign because a lot of people have never even been in one. You know, it's foreign, it's daunting, it's scary. And so if a person is like, no, I'm not interested in going to church, that's not an automatic, oh, they must not be interested in anything to do with God at all. It could very well mean that they need to be engaged at different layers, depending on what level they are in their relationship with God, their proximity to God. They need to be engaged in different ways. Um, and it could take some time before they're ready to actually attend a church gathering, right? Um, so let me, let me unpack these a little bit. The very first layer that we need to engage people in is the layer of trust. When a person is operating from a trauma response, the number one thing that's missing is trust. People don't trust Christians especially pastors. You guys remember that statement I read last week from NBC News <laughs> or ABC? <laughs> uh, pastors are the least trusted people in Australian society, right? So, you know, um, if you thought Pastor Marcus is like, ah, you know, he's the key to making the church grow. I'm actually the key to making the church not grow. So <laughs> the key to making it grow is, is you guys, right? So trust, trust, the number one thing that you have to do is build trust with people. Listen, it says they're their story, right? Listen to their story. And so this requires relationship. And it requires, there's a price that you have to pay to build trust with someone. You don't build trust with someone with flyers or gospel tracks, right? And I'm not knocking those things. I hope I don't come across as cynical about that. Um, I just want to make the point clear. You don't build trust with those things. You build trust by spending time with people and listening to their story without judgment. That's how you build trust. I'm currently discipling a, a woman who's in the middle of transitioning to male, from female to male. She's trans. 
um, discipling a Buddhist guy and a former drug addict and a break dancer. <laughs> right? It's four people that I guarantee you won't be walking into church this Sabbath, which is sad because I think my sermon is going to be nice, but they, they won't be showing up, right? And if I engage them from the perspective of the traditional approach of I have this truth content that I'm bringing to you and you need to listen, they're already traumatized and that just re-traumatizes. And so people react, oh, no, never mind. Because trust hasn't been built. Rapport, connection hasn't been built. So talk to me about trust, guys. Trust, building trust with people in your life who are far from God. You are muted, Jill. You'll have to unmute yourself because everyone's muted right now, so. <laughs> well, um, when you have been traumatized yourself, trust is one of the hardest things to recover. The hardest. Mm -hmm. Now, Pastor Marcos, you explained a lot to me one day, and you just, in a few words, opened my mind to acceptance. But there's still that little doubt, and that's hard. But mm -hmm. you've got to work on it with God, and... Uh, you can get there, but it's a long journey sometimes. Absolutely, absolutely. With, with your typical secular person, and again, I'm going off of my experience here in Australia, I'm currently discipling four. Um, you're talking about a, a minimum of a two year process of building trust. You're not given Bible studies. <laughs> you're not giving them DVDs on prophecy. You're building trust. Yes. And I've tried the other stuff. I've tried the, here's a book, you know, after the first few interactions. Here's a book. Here's a DVD. Here's a link. Check out this sermon. And have been completely written off as a result. So I've changed my approach. And I just take time building trust. With the guys I'm working with right now, it's taken two years to build that trust where now I can actually have spiritual conversations with them. Well, people are at different stages. Some, some are a little faster than others, but generally speaking around two years, build enough trust that they know Marcus isn't just trying to hook me into his religion. He actually cares about me and I have all this evidence and all these memories and all these experiences that show that he really does care about me. And so through building that trust, I can actually have the spiritual conversation, sometimes very difficult spiritual conversations, and I'm not written off the next week because they know what I'm about. They know I'm not just trying to, you know, get them to join my church. They know it's authentic, right? So trust, what, what do you think is the, uh, the, the, the biggest price you have to pay with building trust with people? Let's go to someone, someone who hasn't spoken in a while. Can I answer? Huh, what was the last time Seth spoke? I'm just kidding. Go ahead, Seth. Nobody else is answering, so jump in, Seth. <laughs> well, one of the things that you have to do, I mean, uh, it's quite interesting that you mentioned that. I'll just make a comment before I answer your question. Um, well, this is what Christ did, isn't it? He mingled with people. He didn't tell them about who he was. Mm. But after a while, that's where he bade them follow me. Absolutely. So really... Uh, Really, that's the method that you are talking about there. Uh, but Absolutely. And if I could just jump in for a second, set the yeah. culture today, this is something that amazed me when it, it hit me a few years ago, and I've never forgotten it. The culture today is forcing the church to go back to Christ's method. Yeah. Because for a long time, we got away with marketing and sales funnels and fancy programs. And all of a sudden, nobody cares about that anymore. And it's like, we actually are forced now by the very secular culture we've been called to reach to begin to take on the way of Jesus again. It's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. amazing. Anyways, go on, Seth. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that we have to do, uh, which is not easy to come by, you have to be vulnerable to those people as well. Mm -hmm. uh, because they are vulnerable to you. They are telling you um, really difficult stories about themselves, about their trauma. Mm -hmm. So you need to um, be well, um, confident to share 
about your exactly. trauma as well to build Absolutely. that trust. Absolutely. Absolutely. Side by side. Yes. I've noticed with engaging secular people, if they get any inkling that it's a top down, I'm the guru. I'm the person with no problems who's here to school you. It's, it's done. Right. I mean, we're talking about the most advertised to generation ever. They can smell a sales pitch from a mile away. <laughs> they can smell inauthentic from a mile away. They purposefully recoil to that sort of thing. So you're right, Seth. We, we ourselves, we, we build trust by sharing trust. By, by engaging people on a, on a very deep relational level. And that requires us being vulnerable as well. Uh, and letting people see like, hey, you know what? Uh, yeah, absolutely, I believe in Jesus. And, um, and I've got scars and wounds and pains and things I'm processing. I'm not, you know, I don't have a halo over my head. And, and that actually surprisingly makes people be like, wow, okay, tell me more about this God that you believe in, as opposed to, yeah, look, I have no problems because, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, I can't relate to you. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the next few bits fairly quickly, only because I've only got nine minutes left. But I wanted to slow down on this one because I really feel like this is the main thing um, I, I wanted you guys to walk away with, even if the rest of it, I mean, we're going to revisit it in the coming sessions. Anyways, there's the next one is not this coming week, Friday, but the one after they're going to be every other week from now on. Um, but trust building trust with people. You're not, you, you, at the, at this point, you're already discipling that person. I want you to understand that you're already discipling them. You may not be giving them Bible studies. You may not be teaching them biblical doctrines, but you're but by reflecting the way of Jesus in their world, in their lives, by demonstrating the love of God to them through your actions, through your relationship, the discipleship has already begun. We tend to think that discipleship is, it begins with information. It doesn't. Discipleship begins with relationship. It begins with rhythms, right? Demonstrating the way of the kingdom. And a person is catching that as they interact with you. They're, they're catching that love. They're catching that compassion. You know, something as simple as telling someone, wow, you know, I I'm really proud of you. You know how many people never hear that? Like their whole oh, life? I, <laughs> yeah, I, I told a guy the other day, I'm sure he just started mm. talking about he come out of prison and he's full of all this guilt and he doesn't know how to start by like, getting forgiveness and mm. he just went on I, knew, I didn't know him and I said to him I'm willing to listen and I said um have you ever thought of asking God for forgiveness he said I'm too bad a person I said no that's mm -hmm. when you need him and I said yeah. then after you are that you need to forgive yourself Anyway, he wants to hear more, and I'm hoping that if I one day I can bring him into the church, and mm -hmm. uh, it's just incredible how it happens. But Absolutely. you have to yeah. have the Holy Spirit within you when you go out yeah. and yeah. Um, listen, listen to yeah. them, and listen not only with ears but with your heart open. Yes, there you go. That's a beautiful takeaway. Listen, not only with ears, but with your heart. And we, we have a whole session coming up um, in, in the series as well on the Holy Spirit too, because that's like super central. But I wanted that to be a session all by itself because it's so important. Um, trust, building trust, building trust with people. Um, one really simple way of building trust with people, if you're someone who really struggles with, okay, what does that look like? Uh, this is one that I use. It's bells. I talked about it in a previous sermon, but here it goes again, bless people. And it doesn't have to be dramatic. It could be something really simple. It's usually the small things, right? If you listen to someone and you know, oh, this person likes this drink or they like that food. And when they're unwell, you bring it to them. You know, like it's really simple little things, blessing people, a compliment, telling them you're proud of them. Like those simple little things build rapport. They build trust. It doesn't have to be theatrical. It doesn't have to be a big problem. It doesn't have to cost you money right? It's the simple little things that build that rapport. Eating with them. I mean, th there's something deeply spiritual about the act of eating and deeply emotional, right? When you share a meal with someone, it doesn't have to be dramatic. It, could, it doesn't even have to be a meal. It could just be catching up with someone for a drink, right? Listening again, learning from them um, and, and sharing your own story, your own traumas, your own wounds, being vulnerable, as Seth was saying. 
those that simple little acronym bells if you engage people with that and at first you have to almost do it mechanically you have to wake up in the morning and be like how will i do this today and that and that and that but then over time it becomes second nature you you got to engage it a little mechanically at first because we're so not used to doing it right like we we it's so simple but we're so bad at it so you engage it mechanically at first and then little by little becomes second nature um and when we get to the when we talk about the holy spirit i'll also come back to bells and talk about how listen and learn is up is also not just something you do with the person but you need to be doing that on your own with god because when you're being filled by him that's what really enables you to give right of yourself in a really meaningful way but we'll come back to that um and during this stage what you're basically asking is questions of origin getting to know the person getting to know their family getting to know their dreams where they come from their heritage you know just basic questions of origins to get to know them all right let me see how much time i have left it's 756 i'm going to give you number two and then we'll wrap up and next next time we come back together i'll give you the other layers um okay so that's the very first layer again you could be here for about two years right and and before you get to the next stage the next stage is becoming curious this is the stage where that person looks at you and says set why are you different <laughs> this is where the curiosity begins to and like i said it doesn't always take two years some people respond a lot faster than that some people i mean i think the most incredible thing is when i encounter a secular person and they respond super fast and they're super open to the gospel and they all i done was share one tiny thing that wasn't even like that big a deal at least in my head and next thing i know they're already inviting somebody else like that's the best man like you're just like that's exciting doesn't always happen but there is from time to time you'll have that one person whose discipleship journey literally started five minutes ago and they're already calling their friends it's pretty cool um but generally speaking it takes a while but what you've done is you've you've built curiosity right um there's a missionary who puts it this way christians have to learn the art of living questionable lives and what he means by that it, questionable life is usually not a good thing right it's usually kind of like if you're a questionable person that's not exactly a good thing but he spun that idea on itself because what he what he means by that is we need to lead the kind of lives that make other people ask questions when you're blessing people when you're eating with people when you're listening to people when you're learning from people when you're sharing space your vulnerable space with people that's not something the culture generally does right if you're tempted to think oh everybody does that they do not <laughs> that's a, it's usually the opposite right and so when you live that way and you live out the kingdom those kingdom rhythms that way your life is questionable it's like why is this person like this now i would caution you not to get theatrical with it because then it just is over the top and it can actually push people away just you know be chill um don't don't be you know like what do you call it like the, the the guy who meets a girl and calls her 20 times um <laughs> after she gave her number <laughs> you know don't go overboard but you know just slow gentle there's no rush here it's 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 a, it's a it's a slow journey so build that curiosity and in that curiosity you're you're getting to know their values you're going deeper from their stories like getting to know their values what, what do you think your purpose is in life what are your dreams in life and this is the last thing I'll share and we'll wrap up cuz it's 7:58 um, one thing that I, I like to do in this stage is, is the pray to share, which, which I've shared with you guys before, but it's worth repeating. Um, what I will do is I'll say, all right, um, I'm, um, set is my person of peace. He's the person that I'm reaching out to. I've been building trust with him for a while and, uh, and things, you know, we've built a good relationship. So what I'm going to do is for the next 20 days, cause I really feel like he's ready to get to the stage where, you know, we, we, we start exploring some more. Uh, some deeper, deeper conversations. So I'm going to pray for him for the next 20 days. Every day, I'm going to pray God for the next 20 days. And when those 20 days are over, I'm going to say, Set, I just want you to know, by this point, Set would know I'm a spiritual person, even if I haven't been preaching about it. Um, and I'll say, Set, I just want you to know that I've been praying for you over the last, you know, I, I pray all the time and I've just been praying for you. And then the next one is need. So I share, I pray, and then I share that I've been praying and the next one is need. Is there a particular need in your life that I could pray for? Because I pray all the time, man. You know me. I pray all the time. Is there anything in particular that I could pray for in your life? Now, if Set responds really positively, 
then I take that need, that request, I go back and I pray over it for another set period of time. I might say, God, I'm going to pray over this need in Seth's life for the next 10 days. And then when those 10 days are up, I check in. Hey, Seth, remember that thing you talked about? Um, that thing you wanted me to pray for? I've been praying for you. How's it going? And if Seth responds positively, he might say, oh, yeah, man, actually, you know, keep praying for it. You know, it's still kind of messy or, hey, you know, actually things have gone better or maybe things have gone worse. I don't know. Like, <laughs> But if he responds positively, then it's so easy to say, you know, say, I'm actually curious, like, do you have beliefs? Like, do you have a faith? T talk to me about that. It's so easy. Now, if the person responds negatively, hey, say, I've been praying, you know, I pray all the time. You probably knew that already. And I just want you to know I've been praying for you for the last, you know, a uh, few days or, you know, just just praying for you in general. You don't have to give them the time frame. Now, if Seth responds and says, oh, yeah, look, thanks, but that's eh, not really my thing. Then you just back off and you go back to praying. Right. And you continue to pray for the Holy Spirit to be the one to open Seth's heart because it's not your job to awaken Set to his need of Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It's not yours. All right. Let go of that. Um, and so, you know, maybe he's uh, he's positive, but when you do the check in, he's a bit more resistant. Don't worry about it. Just back off. You continue to pray for him. Right. So now we get into stage three, but I'm not going to talk about that now because we're out of time. Hopefully this is helpful to begin with, guys. Um, again, big takeaways here. There's no silver bullet for secular engagement. Um, there's no silver bullet for mission in the post-church age. It requires incarnation. Um, and it's no surprise because that's what was required to save us, right? God didn't send the flyer from heaven. He came in the person of Jesus. He incarnated himself into a human body. He lived and grew for 30 years, and then he started his mission. Um, it was deep, it was relational, it was slow, and it's the reason why you and I are here today. And engaging our friends and our neighbors, especially in this deeply apathetic age, deeply apathetic toward things about God, is, is not going to happen with cool programs or cool preachers. It's going to happen when we imitate Jesus and we incarnate in the lives of the people around us who see the world in completely different ways. Um, we'll go through the next few stages in a couple of weeks. I'll send some reminders and, um, and I'll also send you guys some resources that you can look at uh, on your own as well. But um, with that said, I'm gonna wrap it up because it's eight o'clock and I gotta finish my sermon for tomorrow. So <laughs> look at that, I'm at Jindalup two weeks in a row. What happened? <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. Uh, our time is up, and uh, as I promised, we're wrapping up. And so I um, just want to thank you for having been with us throughout this time. And I pray that what we've discussed can sink deep into our hearts and, uh, yeah, just really impact the way in which we relate to and reach out to people around us. Help us to be missionaries for you, even in this deeply apathetic age, to reach those around us for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, you guys. Thank you very much. I will see you tomorrow. Yes. Wonderful.